Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Truth in the Name by F. D. Adkins If someone erased your memory, would you still know God? Present Denali's war on crime has yielded unprecedented results, but its consequences are far from anticipated. As he wages war against every remaining criminal, he forms his own personal army at a cost. When Ellie Hatcher finds herself chosen for a pivotal role in this clandestine sect shrouded in mystery, it forces her to leave behind everyone she knows and loves in less than 24 hours. Haunted by guilt and plagued by doubts, she must navigate a treacherous path where loyalty and self-discovery intertwine. But something sinister is at play. As people around Ellie begin losing their memories and surrendering their ability to dissent, she embarks on a race against time to uncover the truth and save the world, and a man she finds herself unexpectedly falling for. I'm thrilled today to be talking with F.D. Atkins, a Christian fiction author and freelance writer, and she's going to come and talk a little bit about her writing journey and I'm sure a bunch of other things because, hey, we're writers and we can talk about writing and our books. So welcome to my show. Well, thank you so much. I have been so excited about being able to talk to you and chat about my book. (laughs) Yeah, I always love to talk with fellow uh, romantic suspense authors, as my listeners know. Now, um, while her pen name is F.D. Atkins, her first name is Farah, so I'm going to call her Farah. So readers, don't get confused. You can find all about her in the notes here, but I think calling her F.D. sounded a little weird, we decided. So I'm going to call her Farah, <laughs> and we're going to, I think we're going to have a lovely we're going to have a lovely chat. So I think uh, let's start with, because this is always fascinating to me, with your, your personal writing journey. How, how on earth did this writing bug, when did you get bitten by the writing bug? How did, you, how did your first book come about? Give us a, give us a short, shortish uh, rundown of that. Well, you know, it wasn't like I set out to become an author, Um, It was more about my journey in a search of what God was calling me to do. Um, I had been a stay-at-home mom. I think at this point my son was 16, so I'd been there 16 years. Um, Both of my kids were teenagers, and I started to feel like, you know, I was doing the same thing every day. My kids still needed me, but not like they did when they were small. (laughs) Um, Of course, my first priority was to be at home for them. If they were sick or, you know, needed help, whatever, was to be there for them. But I just kept having this weight on my heart like I was at this point that I wasn't fulfilling God's purpose for my life. So I just, but I never really thought I had any talent. You know, I was never considered myself to be a writer. And really, I always struggled with creative writing. Um, But I just continued to pray about it. And one morning I had an idea for a Christian fiction novel. I was so uncertain of my ability to do this that I didn't even tell anybody I was writing a book. I just started in my spare time, and it took me about a year just here and there. You know, sometimes I would even skip a few weeks. But I finally finished that first book, and still with no intentions of thinking that it's ever going to be published. Um, But I found a conference online that was local, And the only stipulation was that you had to have a Christian fiction novel in the works. So at this point, I told my husband, and he was like, you should go. So I signed up, but the closer I got, the more nervous I got, thinking I am not going to fit in. I have no writing background whatsoever. Mm. So I signed up, and I think it was the day before the conference. Uh, Now to backtrack a bit, a couple of months prior to that, I had submitted an article to focus on the family, just on a whim, trying to build a resume. But I had, at this point, forgotten about it because I thought nothing would ever become of it, as many submissions as I'm sure they would get. But this day that I'm sitting in front of my computer with these thoughts swirling of backing out of this conference because I'm scared to death I'm going to go in there and just not fit in. (laughs) 
Mm, the imposter syndrome. Uh, yep, we're all familiar yes. with it. <laughs> yes. Yes, these thoughts are like, you are not going to fit in. You don't know anything about writing. What are you doing? Um, but I had gotten an email from Focus on the Family that very day wanting to purchase my article. This was the only article I had ever submitted to anything. So I'm thinking, okay, Lord, this is your nudge saying go to this conference. Mm. So I went to the conference, and it was wonderful. Everybody was wonderful to me, and I didn't feel like that, you know, I didn't fit in. Um, and in actuality, I wound up getting a second nudge as um, one of the speakers was up talking about social media. And as she stepped away from the podium, she just came to a complete stop, turned around and went back. And she said, I just felt like I needed to share that I don't have any education in writing or any of this. I was a stay-at-home mom. And everything that I learned, I learned on my own. And I thought, okay, this is not coincidence. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> so I took away what I learned from that conference, went home and tweaked my book and let other people read it. And they all convinced me to submit it to a tr traditional publisher. You know, all the rules said with no social network, uh, you know, the odds were against me. But in two months, I had a contract for that very first book. Mm. And that's why I write in all of my books for with God, nothing shall be impossible because that right there is only God. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. that. The first book. Yeah, it was not only the yeah. first book that <clears throat> I got published. It was the first one I ever wrote. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, I, I love that story, Sarah. And I think it just reminds us, whether we're readers or writers or wherever we are, that how how much God cares about us. Because, I mean, that's really what I hear kind of underlying this story was, you know, you're at this conference, you're feeling down, because we all feel that way as writers at one point in our life, <clears throat> sometimes multiple points right. along our journey, right? <laughs> and, then, and then God... You know, he can send it from someone else who's a writer. He can send it from anyone else. But I love the way he uses his people to remind his other people, right, that, <clears throat> you know, of the truth of their calling, of the truth that, you know, when God calls us to do something, he, he does equip us. doesn't mean we don't have to do the hard work, because writing is hard work <clears throat> and learning and, oh, and improving yeah. our craft. But when he calls us to do these hard things, whether it's writing or, or raising kids or this job or a, a family member who's ill that you're taking care of or whatever, fill in the blank, you know, mm -hmm. he does along the way, I think, bring us these cheerleaders that we didn't know. Sometimes we don't even know we need them. And sometimes right. they just come right at the right time. And I think it's just so so beautiful. <clears throat> so thank you for sharing oh, that story. And it story. just gives you chills when you look back and you see those things, too, when you know yes. that it's nothing other than God. <laughs> <clears throat> right, yes, yeah. And I often say that it's, um, I mean, I don't know how non-Christians do it. I'll backtrack. You know, because go through life without these little God surprises. I knew someone in my writing group years ago um, who wrote several books about God's surprises. And she said, does, does these little vignettes like you just shared, how God uses circumstance, sometimes not even a believer can <laughs> provide those little God surprises for us. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing your story because it, it's just a, such a wonderful reminder of that and how, <clears throat> and how that, you know, just when we need it the most, along comes that mm -hmm. encouragement to keep us going. So, yay. Yay, that's great. So um, I also wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned you had no social media or anything. I'm assuming you have something now. So how do you, how do you connect to readers now? Um, what is, how do you, what's your favorite well, way to connect with them? <clears throat> um, initially, the first thing I did was I started a website where I share a blog on my website every week. Mm. And it's not best writing. It's just pretty much something from my Bible story or something from my Bible story that connected to my family that week. 
um, just to share how a different message that I felt like God wanted me to share. Um, and now I do have Facebook, um, Instagram, and TikTok, thanks to having teenage children who could help me figure mm-hmm. all that out. <laughs> yeah. But my favorite way to connect with readers uh, is book signings. I just love that face-to-face interaction, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of setting up in a bookstore and I have a table full of Christian books, and that just opens the conversation to be able to share about my faith. Um, and I have met so many wonderful new friends through book signings um, that still connect with me on social media. Yeah, yeah. My, one of my favorites um, that I really enjoy is doing craft fairs um, mm-hmm. as an author. And just it's just it's so refreshing just to meet readers, introduce them to my books, and how many of them, because I usually explain... I write, you know, Christian fiction or inspirational fiction, romantic suspense genre, Mm -hmm. and that they're clean, you know, no gratuitous sex, Mm -hmm. violence, foul language. And it's funny, though, because sometimes they laugh. They're like, I said, so if you want that, you know, don't buy my books and, you know, make it as kind of a joke. But I want it to be clear what they're getting, you know. So, Mm -hmm. but most, it's, it's the majority of people are like, oh, that's just so great. I had one person at a recent craft fair. She's like, I'm so glad you told me that. I'm really going to look at your books now. She goes, I don't like to be surprised. You know, by that. I was like, okay, great. Right. <laughs> you know, but it is, uh, we do love that interaction with readers. We do love, you know, just talking with them. I love hearing, what do you like to read? It might not be my genre, but I still like to know, what are you reading? Are right. you reading? Please tell me you're reading. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. That's always a lot of fun to to get in and um, have those conversations. So um, why what what drew you to Christian romantic suspense? I mean, you, you felt like you wanted to write a novel, so what was it about our genre that you were like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do? Well, um, mostly for me it was the Christian aspect of it and then my love for suspense and action books. <clears throat> um, and that I can have a way of sharing my faith through an action-packed story. I mean, you know, mm. um, as Christians, we still love to be entertained, and we like thrilling in action and, you know, escaping into a good book at the end of the day, uh, you know, to break away from that monotony or whatever struggle that we face that day, escaping into that story. But I love writing that and being able to intertwine a message of faith. Yes. Um, yeah, I've I've heard it said that we have those three threads as Christian romantic suspense writers. We have our faith, mm-hmm. we have the romance, and then we have the suspense that we have to weave together and in, into a pleasing story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which yeah, which can be challenging. Do, do you, what's for you? What's the hardest part of of writing these stories? The hardest part for me, I think are the action scenes because getting enough description to where the reader feels like they're there, but keeping that fast paced edge of your seat um, momentum going, I guess. Um, And then the other aspect of it for me is making sure that I am intertwining the message that God wants me to share in the right way, that it's represented exactly according to his word. Mm, Yeah. To me, that's, that's the two, uh, <laughs> the two, the two hardest parts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and then I think with the, um, for me, it's remembering to. Um, sometimes the romance happens in my head, and I have to remember. Oh, I have to show it on the page too. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I know what's going on. Okay. Oh wait, you don't see that. Okay. Yeah. All right. They need to have a small, small romantic interlude here, even though in my mind they're already, you know, at the end of the book. So, um, right. Yeah, that's that's always a challenge. So we we have time for I think for one more question. So I think we're going to end with um, what do you wish, wish readers knew about the Christian romantic suspense genre? I think the biggest thing <clears throat> is that um, when you say Christian anything Christian book, a lot of people still think of it as being boring. Um, And I think that that's the biggest thing is that they are still filled with action, suspense, romance, and it's a a great thrilling book, you know, but you just, 
don't have the stuff that would dishonor God as you read. You don't, like you said, you don't have the language or any of the inappropriate scenes that we shouldn't be reading. Mm. But you mm-hmm. still have just as much action and suspense and romance and mystery. Um, and you can even intertwine a bit of comedy in it, you know, but it's, it's not boring. It's an action-packed novel. Yes, yes, I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on my show. Well, I really appreciate you having me. I have been looking so forward to chatting with you, um, and hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. And that would be, that would be great. Um, you've been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense, and stay tuned because right after this you're going to hear an excerpt from one of um, F.D. Atkins' books, uh, The Truth in the Name. Now an excerpt from Truth in the Name by F.D. Adkins. Prologue Dark shadows conceal every thought as exhaustion consumes me. Like a loose light bulb flickering from short surges of electricity, every beat of my heart sends pulses of pain shooting through my head. Why are some things so hard to remember? I sit hunched over my computer, massaging my temples as my phone rings. I have an exam in anatomy and physiology in the morning, and for some reason, I can't find a way to memorize all these bones. Temporal bone, ethmoid bone, lacrimal bone, zygomatic bone. I try to focus and ignore the ringing again. This makes the fifth time in the last ten minutes. The ringing stops, and I try to break the skeleton into sections and make up a funny song in my head that will help trigger my memory. I almost have a start, but then there goes that blasted phone again. All right, all right, I spout through gritted teeth as I make my way across to my bag and pull out my phone. It's mom. I should have known when it wouldn't stop ringing, I mumble. My mom is always so persistent. Hella, I start to say. Mom's terrified screams echo so loudly that the phone jumps from my hand and I almost drop it. Mom, what's wrong? Through my sister's sobbing wails, I managed to catch, Your sister! Gone! I look at the clock. Oh no, I was supposed to meet Eileen for lunch. Mom, I can't understand you. I forgot, I was supposed to meet Eileen for lunch. She's probably upset with me. Mom's desperate words finally pour out. Ellie Hatcher, you aren't listening. Eileen never came home from school today. We have tried and tried to reach her, but she won't answer. I called the police. Finally, after badgering them because I knew something wasn't right, they tracked her phone. You know mothers always know when something's wrong. They found her phone in her car, abandoned on the side of the road. I take a deep breath. Eileen has to be okay. My sister has always been a little dramatic, and now that she's 16, she is a lot dramatic. Mom, you know how Eileen can be. She probably just pulled over and got in the car with a friend. Mom's sobs turn into gasps for air. She's so hysterical that she's almost hyperventilating. Why does anyone get it? She wouldn't leave the car door open, leave her keys, her phone, her purse behind. For a moment, it feels as if I'm hovering outside my own body. My heart drops, and I fall to the floor with it. I know my mom is right. This sounds very wrong. My little sister has to be all right. She just has to. How could I have forgotten about lunch today? Now I may never see her again. God, please help her. Please help my sister. Chapter 1 Two Years Later I Run Hard 
all the stress releasing from my body as my feet pound on the trail. At 5 a.m., the running trail that surrounds my apartment complex is deserted, except for a few security guards on patrol. As I jog back up the steps to my studio apartment, the sweat drips from my forehead and my heart thumps. My body is fatigued, but my mind is renewed. For these 30 minutes a day, the weight that crushes my body and soul into the ground lifts, and I feel free. I swipe wisps of hair from my eyes and unlock the deadbolt. First thing in the door, after removing my shoes, of course, because I would never track germs onto the floor of my home, I get on my knees in the living room to read my Bible and pray. God empowers me to get up every day and tackle all the obstacles to come, so I refuse to miss giving thanks for the gift of the day. Today could be a hill, or it could be a valley. Either way, I know I need God's guidance to get through it. I shower, make the bed, and pretty much clean the whole apartment. As I make my way to the kitchen, I do a quick check to be sure the living room tables are perfectly aligned with the lines on the hardwood floors. I power on my laptop, pour coffee in the largest cup I have, and settle at the bar in the kitchen to start my paper. I tap the space bar seven times and start typing. Just as I type the last word of my first paragraph, the phone chimes. Like clockwork, every morning at seven o'clock, my mother texts, then again at noon, and again at three o'clock in the afternoon, and again precisely at nine o'clock, because I go to bed promptly at 9.30. Mom always sends the exact same text. Please text back that you are okay and always know Mom loves you. I quickly message back. All good. I will always know. Love you too. As I lay the phone on the counter, I fight the tears that are pooling in my eyes. If only I could turn back the clock, maybe things would be different. I stare at the photo on the mantel. The girl in the picture has the same dark brown hair and green eyes as me. Even though I'm older, she's taller. I got mom's jeans when it came to height. How could I have forgotten to meet you for lunch that day? If, if, if. Those words keep repeating in my mind, tormenting me. If I had seen you that day, maybe you would have said something that would have helped us to find you. Bzzz. My body jerks at the sound. What? Oh. It's only the intercom buzzer. Who could possibly be here at eight o'clock in the morning? I walk to the door and push the button. Yes, can I help you? A black sedan with dark tinted windows shows on the video feed. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.